This evening we're going to begin a series of studies verse by verse through Galatians. And there's six chapters, 149 verses, 3,084 words, and we're going to look at every chapter, every verse. I don't know if we'll study every word, but we'll move through it probably, uh, you know, three or so messages a, a chapter. So we, it won't take us too long, it being just six chapters. But um, this evening we're going to start just with an introduction uh, to the epistle as a whole. It's always helpful when studying a book of the Bible to start with an overview. What is this book about? What is its main theme and, and message? And if, you get a, if you get an overview, it helps you so much in the details as you begin to consider it verse by verse. In other words, before you go verse by verse through a book, you ought to know what the book's about in general and get the context of the book, and then that'll help you so much as you go through it. Now, in his epistle to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul passionately defends his apostleship and the gospel he received by revelation of Jesus Christ. He defends it against the error of legalism. Legalism basically is a performance-based religious system. Man trying to earn favor and acceptance with God by his works. And that is still so very prevalent today. Now, there's not too many around here saying you've got to be circumcised after the manner of Moses to be saved. But there's a whole lot of churches around here saying you've got to do something. You've got to get baptized in water. You've got to join the church. You've got to do this, that, or the other. They have things they say you need to do either to get saved or to stay saved. But they bring the works of man into it to make them right with God. And... Uh, Boy, there's a lot of legalism in churches today. So this is a very relevant book to study in 2019. There's no shortage of churches in America today. There's more churches around uh, than ever. I mean, they just so many. And yet, sadly, the far majority of them are legalistic. And, and what they teach, even those that are more liberal uh, on, on some things, will say, well, if you do this, that, or the other, then God will bless you. Then you'll be right with God. And that's really the essence of it. When they're telling you there's things you need to do or stop doing to be right with God. Whether you're talking about justification or sanctification. And really, Paul deals with both issues. You know, we often think of legalism in relation to justification, but it also affects how people teach sanctification. In other words, our practical daily life. Concerning justification, look in chapter 2, verse 16. I mean, I don't know how more clear it can be in this verse. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. He said it three times in one verse. You're not justified by the works of the law. And yet a lot of churches stand up and say every Sunday, there's works you got to do to be justified. Concerning sanctification, look in chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So you got these who say, you're not even saved unless you do certain works. But then you have others who say, okay, you trusted Christ, you're saved, but if you're going to be made perfect, now you got to perform. Now you got to do these things. So whether it's justification or practical sanctification to bring the works of man into it. In other words, your performance is legalism. Now, I'll quote from another. I thought it was said so well. i just read this to you. And this comes from a, a teacher from yesteryear by the last name of Baker. He said, The Galatian epistle was written to combat legalism, one of the most insidious of all religious errors. Legalism is insidious because it appeals to man's pride. It deceives man into believing he can justify himself before God by his own works of righteousness. 
on its face, it appears to be very pious, having a front of what Paul calls in Colossians 2.18 a uh, uh, false humility. It covers human pride with a cloak of self-righteousness. Legalism in Paul's day was associated mainly with Judaism, circumcision, the law of Moses. Today, the term is applied to any system of religion which teaches the possibility of earning salvation or of attaining sanctification through the keeping of laws, whether God-given or man-made. And that sums it up. That's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with legalism. It's performance-based religious system. Now, I think key verses in Galatians would be 2.16, which we already read, and verse 20. To combat legalism concerning justification, how clear is Galatians 2.16? But also, pertaining to our sanctification, look in verse 20. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice, it's in Galatians 2.16, the faith of Christ. That's how we're justified, the faith of Christ. How are we going to live the Christian life? Once again, the faith of Christ. In other words, it's all about Jesus Christ and what He's done for us. It's all about Jesus Christ and what He does through us. Okay, that's the Christian life. The Christian life is Christ. Okay, and of course we'll study these verses in depth when we get to them in our study, but I think if you're going to pick out some key verses, I think those are two great verses to, to summarize what Paul's dealing with in combating legalism, Galatians 2.16 and verse 20. Now, how important it is to understand the faith of Christ. And we've taught on that. And we'll deal with it again in this study. But that is one of those things that was revealed through the Apostle Paul. You don't find anybody else in the Bible talking about that doctrine. Now, uh, James and the book of Revelation mentions faith of Christ, but it's talking about his doctrine from his earthly ministry. Um, uh, it's talking about his, his doctrine concerning the kingdom program of Israel. Paul's talking about what was accomplished concerning the body of Christ being justified and sanctified through what Jesus Christ did for us. Uh, and it's something in particular. And so we'll deal with that in this course of studies. Very, very key. And uh, I always want to mention this to you. If you want to understand the importance of the King James Bible, you don't even have that doctrine in the other versions. The modern versions omit that doctrine. Even the New King James Version, which is not new and not really King James, but they call it New King James, they, they change faith of Christ. And it, 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 doesn't, it says faith in Christ. Now, obviously, we need to have faith in Christ. But the doctrine concerning the faith of Christ, that's key. The devil's trying to hide that, isn't he? Yeah, he is. That's why it's omitted in these new versions that tamper with the Word of God. Now, the Apostle Paul established the churches in the region of Galatia. And Galatia uh, is the area, uh, no, if you look on a map, if you've got a map in the back of your Bible, and you, you notice the map there about Paul's journeys, you can look there and see the island of Cyprus. If you look north of that, up in Asia Minor, there's a region in there. Uh, Galatia, that takes in a number of towns. So Galatia is not a town or a city. It's a whole region, a Roman province. It's in that area, Asia Minor. And he went through that area in his second journey. Looking at, hold a marker in Galatians. Look in Acts 16. Get a little background here. Acts 16, verse 6. Now Paul goes out on his second journey, and it says in verse 6, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now that's an interesting thing, and I'm not going to stop and deal with that, but uh, Paul was very careful in following the Lord's leadership and how to go about things and what he was doing. 
but all I want to point out in the verse is it says they went throughout that region. I believe it's at this time these churches get started. Uh, there's not any detail given about his ministry there. You know, in the book of Acts, all the details of Paul's ministry during that time is not given. Uh, what is given is there for a, for a, for a purpose, and, but not every detail is there. Some things are kind of just skipped over. But we, as far as I can tell, uh, this would have been, some try to make the case that it was actually during his first journey, and they include some areas south, and they get into this whole thing about the northern Galatia theory versus the southern Galatia theory. And the, you get a commentary, you'll see three pages on all this stuff. It really doesn't matter when it comes to understanding the book of Galatians, so I'm not going to bore you with all of that. I'm just simple-minded enough to say, where is it mentioned Galatia? Well, here it is in Acts 16. This is the first time there's any mention of Paul going there. Seems clear to me that's when he went preaching the gospel and getting churches started in Galatia. All right. Now look in chapter 18 of Acts. Acts 18. So he's going out on his third journey now. And it says in Acts 18, verse 22, when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church. Now, by the way, that's very significant. He goes up to Jerusalem here, but nothing's really said. And that's a whole other thing you can do a study on. And, 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 and it's, it's easy sometimes to miss some of these details if you're not reading the Bible carefully. But he had gone up to Jerusalem again. There's several trips Paul makes to Jerusalem in his Acts ministry. It's very significant. But anyway, he saluted the church. He went down to Antioch. That was his home base for his ministry. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia. So it's a region. It's a country. It's not just a town, not just a city. And there were a number of churches started throughout that region, started throughout that country through Paul's ministry. What was he doing? He went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now, let me just stop here and say this. Paul toiled and travailed and worked by the power of God to get people saved. But he also toiled and travailed and worked by the power of God to get believers established. Paul didn't just get, tell people how to get saved and leave them alone. Getting saved is just the beginning of a new life in Christ. You need, to, you need to grow in the faith. God will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And I like how he said in Galatians 4 and verse number uh, 19, My little children of whom I travail in birth again... That's figurative, obviously. He's saying, I'm travailing like a woman in birth until Christ be uh, formed in you. He said, I, I, I travailed to get the gospel to you. Now I'm travailing to help you get grounded in the truth. And the truth will, will result in Christ being formed in us. So you, you, the, the goal of the ministry is to get people in Christ and then to get Christ formed in them. <laughs> through being grounded in the faith. So in Acts 18, as soon as he heads out on his third journey, he, he starts off going back over that area in Galatia to strengthen, it says, strengthening all the disciples. Now, it's possible, and I can't be dogmatic about it, but if I had to take a guess, I would say he wrote Galatians in Acts 18, verse 22. When he had gone back to Antioch, I think he got word about trouble in Galatia. And I think he wrote this letter to them, and then he followed it up with personal visitation. <laughs> Paul wasn't the type just to send a strong letter. He'd go tell you to your face. And he's having to straighten these people out because they're getting moved away from what he had taught them uh, by the legalist that had come in to trouble them. So... I think when he was at Antioch, he might have gotten word about trouble in Galatia, and that's why he, when he left to go on his third journey, he started there, helping those people. Or maybe in his third journey, somewhere along the line, he wrote this letter. But it makes sense to me. He goes and gets the church started. Then when he goes back to Antioch, he gets a message about trouble going because of uh, the legalists. And so... When he starts his third journey, he starts off going back to strength. Why does he have to strengthen them? Well, we all need to be strengthened in the faith, but I think he knew they were in trouble. And he made it a priority to go back through there. 
So that would put, if that's the case, that would put this as one of Paul's earliest letters. Probably 1st and 2nd Thessalonians was his earliest, and then Galatians. Okay, I think those three are his earliest epistles. He wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. I think the internal evidence in, in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians proof he wrote it during early, during the book of Acts, uh, his earliest, probably at time of, you know, in Acts 17 in there, Acts 17, 18, beginning of 18. You, if you want to know when a book is written, you've got to look for internal evidence in the book to tell you. And I think there's things that bear this out that he wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he wrote Galatians. He also wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans during the book of Acts, okay, and the other epistles afterward. And that's, that's important to understand um, as far as his Acts epistles and his prison epistles. Um, there are some differences. Um, you know, in other words, there's some things going on in the transition period that stop. And you can see a reflection of that in the way some of the things he deals with in his Acts epistles and those he wrote after Acts. But it's still the same ministry. It's one body of Christ. It's not, uh, it's not this thing that some try to say there was two different bodies of Christ. There's one body of Christ. But yeah, he went to the Jew first uh, during the book of Acts. And there's some distinctive things about his Acts epistles uh, as compared to those he wrote after the book of Acts. So, uh, this is the only epistle Paul addresses to a group of churches. He doesn't say to the saints uh, at a particular place. He says, notice in Galatians 1, verse number and he says uh, unto the churches of Galatia so that's the only epistle he writes like this he's not just sending it to a particular church and of course his, his epistles were passed around they were in other words if he when he wrote an epistle to a to like the to the Ephesians it wasn't just that the Ephesians read it it, it would get copied and passed around and so on but all his other uh, epistles he writes to a particular church, it's addressed to a particular church, to the saints, and you talk about in Christ, that's the body of Christ, but then in Ephesus, at Philippi, you know, in these, these local churches in these areas, uh, or he wrote to uh, individuals like Timothy and Titus and Philemon. But here, he says, this is unique, he says, to the churches of Galatia. And... Um, you know, I'll just say this, that if you can't be in the body of Christ unless you're saved. That's how you get in the body of Christ. When you believe the gospel, the grace of God, you're baptized immediately by one spirit and one body. But it's possible to go to a local church and not be saved. And so Paul says some things in Galatians where he's wondering about some of these folks. <laughs> you know? Uh, just because somebody goes to a local church that is trying to preach the gospel and teach the Bible, that, don't just assume that they're saved. There are lost people in local churches. So that might help us in some verses in Galatians, some things he says. Note, he's writing to a group of local churches. Okay, So he doesn't say to the saints because perhaps he knows or he thinks there may be some lost people there. Um, and so, another thing is this is an epistle that he wrote with his own hand. Look in Galatians 6, verse 11. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. Somebody said he had to write with large uh, letters. Now, <laughs> It, you could take that, it's, he considered this to be a long letter, or you could take it to be that he wrote with large uh, handwriting, I, whatever. The point, some people try to, you know, he had that thorn in the flesh, and some think it may have something to do with his eye disease, uh, because, you know, he talked about in Galatians um, 4, in verse number um, 15, 
Where, where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Maybe he's saying that because they knew he had some serious trouble with his eyes, and they, uh, you know, at one point they they had such uh, uh, respect for him and love for him, they would have given them their eyes, you know, whatever. But the point is this: oftentimes. You know, Paul, his 13 epistles. And how do we know which epistles Paul wrote? Because they all start with the first word. They all start with the same first word. Paul. <laughs> That's the token in every epistle he wrote. There were some forgeries going on. Like the Thessalonians. He said, there's a letter as from us. It was a counterfeit. He said, there's a token. 2 Thessalonians 3.17 he said there's a token in every epistle. Paul would sign his name as the first word in every epistle. Okay? So Romans through Philemon. That was the token. But often, like in Romans, 16 chapters, he, he gave those words. It was given by inspiration of God, but a man named Tertius actually is the one who wrote them down. They were given through Paul, but he would have someone else, like a secretary, writing them down. But this letter, I think it's clear, according to Galatians 6 and verse 11, he wrote it with his own hand, the whole thing. And if you have bad eye trouble, it would seem like a long letter writing six chapters with your own hand if you can't hardly see what you're doing, you know. I don't know. Maybe I, that's a little bit of speculation, I guess. But it's interesting. Just some unique things about, about Galatians. Now, the legalists loved to come in behind Paul's ministry in an area, wherever he'd go and get churches started, sure enough, as soon as he left, they'd come in right behind him. And they'd come in there and they'd try to turn the church against Paul and they'd try to influence the churches he established away from the message of grace and try to bring them under the bondage of the law. They were um, just a real pain in the neck, okay, during Paul's... Ministry and they're they're like that still today. I mean, uh, for an example, the so-called Church of Christ, they're legalists. They say you're not saved unless you get baptized with their baptism, the way they do it, and that, and you have to keep the commandments and you have to this and they're legalists, plain and simple. And uh, one of the things they'll do if a man's on the radio trying to preach the gospel, they'll do everything they can to buy up the time right after him and try to oppose what he's saying and lead people away from what he's saying. And I've had that happen to me when, when, we, when we came up to this area and got on the radio. It, I had a preacher tell me, you watch it. If you start a radio ministry, a Church of Christ preacher will get on right after you and try to... And that happened just like that. I mean, I wasn't on the radio a couple of weeks and this guy gets on, he buys the time right after, and his whole message was trying to refute what I was saying. And he'd say... Now, Pastor Osteen says, but the Bible says, and he'd give Acts 2.38, Mark 16, you know, the typical stuff. And, and they try to cause trouble. You know, they, they don't have a real ministry, right? So they try to come in behind people who are doing something for God, and they try to get the people they're trying to minister to turn away over to their false doctrine. And that's the way they still work today. So they'd come in there, and they would give all kind of problems to those that uh, Paul had preached to and taught and they were saying look you may have believed on Jesus Christ as your savior but if you don't get circumcised like it says in the law of Moses and you don't do the works of the law you're not going to you're not going to be saved um, you're just not going to be right with God and look in Acts 15 Acts 15 and Paul brings up this issue of Acts 15 in Galatians 2. But this is exactly what would happen. Uh, in Acts 15, verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except to be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. So it was a big fight. <laughs> okay? 
They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Now, I'll deal with this when we get to Galatians 2. But I'm just showing you that, that's what would happen. They'd come in there and say these things, and Paul would have to go to battle. Now look, Paul said at the end of his ministry, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. And he encourages us. I mean, look, he told uh, Timothy, war a good warfare. In 1 Timothy 1, he says that in the context. He's telling Timothy, teach no other doctrine. The doctrine of grace that I taught you, I got it from the Lord. You stand for that because there are legalists coming in. He said they desire to be teachers of the law. They don't understand what they're talking about. And he's, and he's telling Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, you've got to stand against that. There is a fight the good fight of faith. I'm not talking about fighting about little things and preferential things. I'm talking about doctrine. I'm talking about the truth. I'm talking about salvation by grace and what it means to be under grace. That's a fight because it's going to be opposed. The devil's opposing it and he's got his preachers and he's got his churches. And look, look in Galatians 2. Paul uses this language quite a bit. Uh, the warfare. You know, Paul's warfare. I mean, look, the, the trouble he dealt with the most was from the religious world. And you know how the devil's working today? It's called the mystery of iniquity. It's iniquity in the form of religion. The religious system. That's what we have to deal with. I mean, I don't have... The out and out worldly people don't care nothing about God at all. They're not... They don't... I mean, I don't. I've not hadn't had too much trouble for them. It's it's those uh, people out there that are so religious and self righteous. They don't like what we're trying to teach and stand for. But Galatians two verse five. We'll back up to verse four. That because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately despite our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. What was Paul's attitude about it? To whom we gave place by subjection? No, not for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Okay, not every fight is a good fight. There are a lot of people out there fighting about things that don't, I mean, they ought not to be fighting about. But we ought to know what the good fight is. The good fight is the good fight of faith, has to do with sound doctrine, has to do with the truth. And we need to stand. Uh, for the message of grace in this age of grace. And we see Paul, our apostle, that we're told to follow after as the pattern and spokesman for this age. We see how he had to deal with this and we still today have to deal with this. We need, by sound doctrine, Paul told Titus, holding fast the faithful word that by sound doctrine we can exhort and convince the gainsayers. He said, there are many unruly uh, talkers and deceivers. He said, especially they of the circumcision. <laughs> and I'm not going to run all the references, but you see this theme again and again in Paul warning us about these false teachers and their legalism and how to deal with it and that we must deal with it. Now, they, uh, they were, sadly, they were having success in Galatia. I'm just let's let's hit some verses in Galatians. Uh, you, you get the point here. He's dealing with these legalists and how they'd come in and brought trouble and false doctrine always troubles the believers. Um, sound doctrine comforts and strengthens false doctrine troubles. But Galatians one verse six. I marvel that you are so soon removed. That's apostasy, moving away from the truth. From him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Again, we already read it, Galatians 2.16. He's saying a man's not justified by the works of the law. He's having to say that because that's what they were being told by these guys. Uh, verse 21, Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law then Christ is dead in vain. So that's what they were saying. You're not righteous unless you do the works of the law. In Galatians 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. 
Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Look in chapter 4. Verse 8, How be it then, when you knew, not, uh, you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods, but now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel in you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh you despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. But how is it now? Look at verse 17. Verse 16, rather. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth? These people are being moved away from what He taught them. And whereas they had so highly esteemed Him, now He's like their enemy. He said, they zealously affect you, they, these false teachers, but not well. He said, uh, yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I'm present with you, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again till Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So it's obvious what's going on here. Look in chapter 6. Or excuse me, chapter 5. I mean, in every chapter you get the sense, the emphasis. Chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. In other words, if you're going to trust in circumcision, that you must be circumcised, then you've got to do the whole law. And what's the point of Christ's salvation, if that's the way it goes? He said, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You're fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you'll be none of the wise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And if I, brethren... Uh, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The religious world's offended by the preaching of the cross. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Look in chapter 6. I'm not, I'm, we're going to go through this and teach on what he's saying. I'm just reading this to you. You get the sense of what's going on here. Chapter 6. Verse number 11. You see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, that world, when he talks about the world, that includes religion. The things of the world, the things you can do in your flesh in this world. It's not just when you, when you see being crucified on the world. It's not just talking about the things of this evil world in the sense of secular worldliness, but even the world of religion, okay? He said, By whom the world's crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. Well, what veils something? Here it is, a new creature. That's the body of Christ. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, the new creature, the body of Christ, and mercy, and, here's another group in the book of Acts, upon the Israel of God. That's the little flock, the believing remnant. Uh, true believing Israel. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. 
I mean, he was marked up with all the beatings he took and all the persecution he went through. Now, I think you get the point there, right? Of what's going on in Galatians. Now, let me encourage you, by the way, that as we go through this, read it as much as you can. I mean, it don't take you long to read it at one sitting. And, and, and be reading this and studying it on your own. Then we can come together on Wednesday night and talk about it and study it. Um, the best preparation, like before I even started making notes on this or anything, I just was reading it, you know, and thinking about it and praying about it. Just read it and, 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 and carefully read it. Get, get, get the whole epistle in, in your heart and mind. And then as you go through it in detail, things will... It'll be easier to understand some of the things you're reading if you get the, the main point of what's going on. Now, the Scripture not only reveals sound doctrine, it also reproves and corrects for failure to believe and live by that doctrine. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, Instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. You got to get the doctrine, that's what's right. The reproof, that's what's not right. Correction, that's how to get it right. The instruction is how to keep it right. Okay? You got to have that. And, you know, a balanced Bible based ministry not only teaches sound doctrine, that's the positive aspect. But there's the negative aspect of reproving and correcting. That's part of a Bible ministry. And you see Paul's epistles laid out in that manner. His church epistles, there are three major doctrines that are dealt with more than that, but I'm talking about the emphasis, and we've gone over this ground before, so I'm not going to do too much of it right now. But you have justification by the faith of Christ. You have the church, the body of Christ. And then you have our blessed hope of the coming of Christ. That, those things were revealed through the Apostle Paul. And there were other things revealed. But his church epistles are structured according to those three main key doctrines. Romans, Corinthians, and Galatians is one set having to do with the theme of justification by the faith of Christ. Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians is another set having to do with the body of Christ. Thessalonians deals with the coming of Christ. So you have Romans, that's the doctrine concerning justification by the faith of Christ. First and second Corinthians is reproof for not walking by that doctrine practically. And Galatians is correction for listening to doctrine contradicting that of Romans. Okay, and taken together, it's instruction in righteousness. It's the same thing with Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Ephesians is doctrine, the body of Christ. Philippians is reproof for not walking by that doctrine. Colossians is correction for listening to false doctrine contrary to that doctrine. And it's the same thing in Thessalonians. The two epistles together, it's the same thing. The doctrine, reproof, and correction all together is the instruction in righteousness. Okay, that's the order of of the church epistles. The church epistles are not arranged chronologically. Galatians was written before Romans. But it's placed after Romans because it has to do with correcting false doctrine contrary to Romans. The doctrine that's in Romans is what Paul preached in Galatia. Okay? So there's, a, there's an order. And I probably should have put that on the board, but I didn't. You, you, I got those outlines. If you go on our website and go to the the blogs and different writings. We have those outlines. You can get those. But I'm going to give you an outline of Galatians here before we close just a minute. But that, that, that's so important to understand the, the order there. So the churches at Galatia, they were, they were listening to this legalism. It's contrary to salvation by grace through faith alone as laid out in Romans. Look back quickly in Romans 3. Romans is the foundational book of doctrine for the age of grace. That's why it's placed first in the order of the church epistles. And the theme of it is justification by faith alone. In other words, it's not faith plus works. It's faith without works. Furthermore, it's the faith of Christ. Romans 3.19, Now we know 
that what things soever the law saith, it saith them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, you notice that? But now in this age of grace, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, there's no difference. There's no difference in this age between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption as in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Here it is. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now that is Paul's me message of grace given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, revealed through him, Look, you go over to the book of James, which is written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, and you find James saying, it is not faith alone. All right? I always got to clarify, James is not teaching a man is justified by works either. What he is teaching is a man must prove his faith by his works because that's the message they're dealing with. This message says, the moment you believe, you're instantly justified by the faith of Christ. The difference, my friend, between Paul and what he teaches about justification and the Apostle James is the difference between the faith of Christ and a man's faith. A man's faith must be proven. Prove your faith, right? But if we're justified by the faith of Christ, that's already proven. That's why the moment we believe, it's done. There's a different thing there. So this is what we're dealing with back in Galatians. Um... So the, what they're listening to, this legalism, is, is contrary to what Paul laid down in Romans. And so Galatians is written to correct that. It's a companion to Romans. And again, the Corinthian letters, they, that, that's got to do with that reproof or practical failure. Their conduct is not in line with the doctrine of Romans. Uh, so that's how these things are structured. Now, doctrinal and moral failures not to be tolerated and taken lightly because Paul said just it takes a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. Leaven is, it symbolizes corruption that spreads. So twice Paul said a little leaven leavens a whole lump. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, that had to do with uh, immorality in the church. Here in Galatians 5, verse 9, it has to do with false doctrine in the church. Doctrinal corruption produces moral corruption because what you believe determines how you behave. And Paul told the Corinthians, be not deceived. He said, evil communications corrupt good manners. He warned in 2 Timothy 2 about uh, the false doctrine that will eat as doth a canker and how it produces ungodliness. But there are verses where Paul talks about the sound doctrine which produces godliness. So the doctrine is vital. And when you let a little leaven in, it'll spread, it'll get worse. It must be dealt with. You must fight the good fight of faith. You can't be negligent in the ministry. You've got to be active. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to watch. You've got to put on the whole arm of God. And you got to fight the good fight. Now, quickly, and we'll about wrap this up. We have, if you're going to outline Galatians, it's this simple. And you ought to write this down. It gives you a little bit of a, a framework as we go through this. Personal. The first section in Galatians is very personal. Paul is defending his apostleship. He's defending the gospel he received by revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what you might call the personal section. That's chapters 1 and 2. Then you have what you might call the doctrinal section. And that's 3 and 4. 
Now the whole epistle is doctrinal, but the emphasis in 3 and 4 is setting things straight doctrinally. And then you have the practical. Chap the first two chapters is personal, Paul dealing with his, his ministry. Uh, it, the, the next two, the, the middle chapters are very doctrinal. And the last two are practical. And basically you could say it like this. In the first two, he's defending. In the middle, he's explaining. In the last, he's applying. Concerning his message of grace, he's defending it, he's explaining it, he's applying it. That's what's going on in these six chapters. Alright, so let me just say a brief word about that and we'll wrap this up. Look in um, Galatians 1 verse 1. Just, get, just right off the bat you see it. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Look at verse 12, or excuse me, verse 11. I certify you, brethren. I, I mean, this is certified, okay? He's being challenged. I certify you, brethren, the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look in verse 20. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. What does that tell you? They were saying he was lying. Okay, so what you have, the first two chapters clearly establish Christ gave Paul a message and ministry that was distinct. He was not one of the twelve apostles. He had a unique apostleship as the apostle to the Gentiles. It was a new message in ministry. And so therefore it was constantly under attack. And so God inspired Paul to defend his apostleship in ministry. Not himself as a man, but, but his apostleship in ministry. He defends it in Galatians. He defends it in 2 Corinthians. And in other passages, it was constantly under attack. And it's of great importance because he's the spokesman and pattern for this age of grace. All right? In the middle chapters, again, in chapters 3 and 4, he's explaining, he's contrasting. You know what he's saying? You can't mix law and grace. That's the main point there. And what he does is he uses Abraham to prove the historical precedent of God imputing righteousness by faith before the law and without the law, because Abraham wasn't under the law. <laughs> and he uses Abraham, and, he, and we see that we are children of Abraham in the spiritual sense that we are in Christ, and Christ is the seed of Abraham, and in the spiritual sense that we're counted righteous by faith. Not at all in the sense that we replace the nation of Israel. And I heard a guy just recently trying to use Galatians to teach replacement theology. And we're going to deal with that when we get in chapters 3 and 4. I mean, it's in Galatians, he said, in the body of Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Galatians 3, 27, 28. We're, we're not Israel, we're the new creature. It's in Galatians 6, he contrasts the new creature with the Israel of God. Israel is not a new creature. The new creature is the body of Christ that's neither Jew nor Gentile. We did not replace Israel. We are separate from Israel, and God's not finished with Israel. So we'll be dealing with some of that in this study. And then in the last two chapters, as far as the application, you know what? Paul is showing that the law is not required to live a righteous life. Paul said, the law is not made for a righteous man. 1 Timothy 1.9 You know, many that preach salvation by grace today will turn around and teach sanctification by works. And they get legalistic because they feel like people won't live right unless they put them under bondage, put them under the law. But putting believers under the law does not stop sin. It only increases it because uh, the strength of sin is the law. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Romans 6, Paul said, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What does that tell you? If you put yourself under the law, sin will have dominion over you. He's showing the grace life is lived on a higher plane than the law system, and when you walk in the Spirit and have the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law against that. You don't have to be under the law. But we, we are operating by the law of Christ, Galatians 6 talks about the law of Christ and the law of sowing and reaping. 
Did you know there's, there's not... When, you, when you're in your Bible and you're studying on law, there's all kind of different laws mentioned in the Word of God. Yeah, we're not under the law of Moses, but that doesn't make us lawless. But he's showing in those last two chapters, look, you don't have to be under the law to live right. Christ can be formed in you by His Spirit through faith. So he's defending the message of grace. He's explaining the message of grace. He's applying the message of grace. That is what's going on in Galatians. Now, Lord willing, next time we'll start chapter 1, verse 1, and start going through it. And we'll finish this in about the year 2025. Uh, I hope the Lord comes tonight. But if not, we look forward to studying Galatians for a little while. All right? Let's pray together.